What is up, everyone? I am Jeff Lund, and this is the Mediocre Alaskan Podcast, where we are intolerant of weak-minded attitudes that keep people from pursuing new and exciting things in the areas of fitness, outdoors, and general lifestyle. We're going rural today. We're going to my uh, hometown of Klawak, Alaska, uh, to talk to a friend of mine, Corby Weimler. He uh, is a teacher at uh, in Klawak City School District. Uh, population of the school is uh, around 100, I believe. Population of the town is six to 700. Uh, at least that's what it was when I was going to school there. But um, going to talk uh, rural education uh, with uh, with Corby Weidmiller, one of the most dedicated teachers that I've known in my career. Spends a lot of time making sure that uh, his classroom lessons are prepared well, and then also spends a lot of time outside of school providing kids with uh, activities and clubs and things to uh, enrich their lives uh, even more. Excited for that. Uh, coming up next, uh, this episode is brought to you by Catch Can CrossFit, uh, Catch Can's CrossFit Gym. You can go to catchcancrossfit.com and check them out there. Kevin Manabat is the owner. You can find him on Instagram. Send him the direct message and see if you want to drop in or join. It's up to you. Episode 13, coming up next. All right, man, I'm here with uh, Corby Weimler. Uh, let's talk some rural rural education, man. Yeah, you're a product of it. I'm a product of it. Um, how do you think we turned out? Oh, I, I think pretty good. I think we had a, a pretty unique, unique perspective on uh, a world you don't realize how how different you know growing up here is until you get out of here and you start seeing you know life down south and some of those things. Just how how unique your your schooling is and and just the, the whole lifestyle of living on an island, uh, being in a rural community. Everybody knows everybody and. Yeah, it's a whole, whole different world that a lot of people don't don't quite get. Yeah. Um, as you know, I I grew up here on Prince of Wales Island. Uh, my family's kind of spread out. We got my dad's side of the family's from the Bay Area and uh, California, and then mom's side of the family's from the Midwest. So I got connections to some different parts there, so I have some reference to different places. And mm-hmm. grew up here. Uh, got to uh, spend my first five years actually living out on a float house in an extremely rural environment uh, out in uh, one of these islands off of, off of Prince of Wales here. I had no neighbors around to speak of, really. And, um, yeah, and that was just the norm for us, you know, living, living kind of out in the bush and fishing every day off the, the front porch and, you know, going out hunting and doing all those kind of things. Yeah, all those archaic things that we don't have to do anymore, right? Because we've evolved so much and we have Amazon. <laughs> yeah, right. People think that if you grew up in Alaska and you had the rural education that you've missed out on certain things, and there's that kind of qualifier that, well, you're smart for a kid who grew up on an island in Alaska. What are some skills that you may have had um, as far as communication, education, whatever, practical lifestyle that that – enriched your life rather than deprived it? What was something about uh, growing up here that, that made you have a better idea of reality rather than go to a big school in a big town in an urban setting? Yeah, I think, um, you know, just just the, the, the family connection here where, where people really look out for each other. Um, you just get a feeling of, of building a community uh, working with other people, I mean, you gotta. If you know everybody, you're gonna you're gonna look out for people and, and help others. Um, just just kind of that. That's just what you do, you know. It's, it's I believe in you know being kind, and, and that's kind of something that that sometimes is lost in a larger a larger setting. I feel so. Mm-hmm. Just having having that installed, and that's just that's just one of those universal truths of life. You gotta. Don't be an a hole, you know. Yeah. Be, be kind to one another. Be kind to to, to your family and, and the people around. And if somebody's in a tough spot, you help them out. You know, you bring them bring them a, a slice of fish, or you know, go and help chop some firewood for an elder. Mm-hmm. It's just something that it's kind of installed in a small town life here. Yeah. Um, and then just I don't know, just having a the ability of living living with nature, having that connection. Um, it's kind of unique for a lot of people here growing up with 
you know, always being around it, just something you might take for granted too. And then when you get south and you're around all the concrete and the skyscrapers, it really puts some things into perspective of how, how lucky we are, how fortunate you are. Mm-hmm. Walk down to the beach and there's, you know, there's, there's dinner and, you know, get out in the boat and in a few minutes and into the woods and all that's right in your backyard. So I think, you know, that connection to nature is huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then just, you know, the, the unique uh, experience of travel in Southeast Alaska, I was just saying, you know, it's kind of silly. We're, we're only about 75 miles away, you know, from, from Craig or Kalak to, to Ketchikan. And here we are doing a, a phone interview, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. You know, we should be sitting face to face and hour drive away, but here it is, you know, five and a half hours later, I'm with the drive and the ferry and everything to yeah. come see you. So it's uh, just that experience of being able to travel and see these different communities and, um, you know, through sports and, and all the other activities and things that the Southeast school provide to spend a lot of money for, for our kids to do and for me to do when I was when I was in school, that was, that was huge. Yeah. There, there are a couple things that, uh, that I, that I like a lot about being here. Uh, not only growing up, I didn't appreciate it at the time, of course, but, uh, now looking back that yeah. we're still behind with certain things. Like it's still like, you, you know, talking about, it's a very short distance, but because of the limitations, uh, travel wise, you know, there's a body of water between us. It takes planning. It takes patience. It's not just immediate. Okay. I want to go there and I, I just want to drive there. Uh, and then also on the other side of it, as far as like, you know, you mentioned, uh, going out and getting your own dinner, you know, when you, when people down South go to the store, you know, they're getting, you know, fish that maybe kids around here, you know, they're, they're the first part of that process working on a seine boat or something like that, or, or trolling during the summer, they are the, they get the meat and then it's shipped and down and then provide. So like we're on the other side of that, you know, we are the faces, well, not me cause I've never done it, but <laughs> Um, the, the kids here and, and, you know, you, you, uh, commercial fisher in the summer, like we are the face of the people who get that food for the grocery stores down South. And so I think that's just such a huge, important perspective and the kids, uh, as providers, I think is an important skill that's really being lost because it's all about, I have money. I'm just going to go get it. Someone else, some faceless, someone gets it for me. And all I have to do is trade money. There's that that work that's been eliminated from it, and I think it's uh, well. What, what what do you think we lose by that as a society or culture by not having that connection to our resources? What do you think uh, is the detriment in our culture? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, food is such a you know important part of our lives, and uh, you know something we you know you definitely appreciate more. And the, like you said, the patience and the the skills that go into putting that food onto the plate um, when you're growing your own food, when you're when you're out there harvesting your own meat or fish, it's um, yeah, it gives you a whole new perspective when you go into the store and you, you got a you know a prepackaged uh, you know uh, sandwich or whatever, and you think of all the all the time and work that goes into something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it gives you it gives you a whole new life, and then just the, the health a- health aspect of of eating your own your own food that, that you're preparing and you're you're harvesting, I mean that's 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 huge as well. Um, but yeah, I mean just the skills that, that go into that too. We talk about commercial fishing. I think uh, you know I, a huge part of my education growing up was uh, by the time I was able to walk, I was out on a boat and uh, you know learning skills of you know doing the fishing itself, but you know learning about the engine and. Uh, electrical work. It's like you have five different trades that you're learning there out on the boat as you're growing up and going out and going fishing. So, um, you know, all kinds of repair skills and, and, uh, navigation and, and, uh, science and all that stuff is combined. But a lot of people don't think, you know, commercial fishermen, they're, you know, they're hardworking and they, they go out and they catch fish, but you have to have all these, these skill sets to, to be, uh, effective and, and, uh, yeah, a lot of people don't realize the the, uh, the amount of intelligence and and uh, yeah skills that go into that job. Because there's there's a lot of different things you need to know if you're going to mm-hmm. make any money at it. Right. right. Another thing you mentioned was uh, the elders. You know, giving giving fish or providing. You know, if, if you happen to be successful, providing uh, food to elders and this and that. Um, Why clock being a predominantly native community. 
uh, and me being, you know, Scandinavian. Um, it, it was really, I, again, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but just how much this, the town claimed me as, as, as a community member. Um, and then you go down south and you just see that if you use the term native or Indian, you know, people like automatically think like casino or something. And it's just, it's, it's horrible that there so much culture has been lost mm-hmm. down in the lower 48. And I didn't appreciate it until, you know, you know, being back and just seeing that, you know, people speak the language and you have people like, like John Rowan who are just master carvers and the, the, the beautiful art and keeping that alive. And it's so rich and so robust and um, the, the respect for the elders thing, you know, you go to the basketball games, you go to, you know, whatever it is, you got that, that, that seating for the elders and has that respect of the elders. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, about that, how the community being, you know, accepting of, uh, of people and being rich in, in those sort of values. Obviously there's, there's exceptions to every rule and there's, you know, not every single person is totally respectful. And, um, but, uh, talk about the, the values that, uh, that kids could potentially have reinforced in a community like, uh, like Craig and Kloak. Yeah. Um, you know, it's definitely something that's, that's installed in, in the household and through the community, through the schools at a very young age. And, um, it, yeah, it's awesome to see the the strength of culture here in this community. Um, you know, just walking up through the Totem Park and the and the the artwork that these students are able to produce here is incredible. I mean, he's selling at a you know catch a can thrift store for thousands of dollars. Some of these pieces of these students are creating as high school and high school students. So pretty pretty incredible opportunities to have here for that. Um, and yeah, I, you know, like it's funny you say that this Tuesday we're having the the elder lunch in here where all the elders will be coming in. We'll be serving food that students are preparing. I got kids baking pies, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon for that. And, um, it's just, you know, it's just, like I said, part of, part of the lifestyle here of, you know, treating those people with that wealth of knowledge and that have been around and, and, uh, and give so much to the community in their own way. And you just, uh, yeah, you just honor those people that, that are here for, for, for the youth and to pass on all that information um, through stories and, and all that, that importance. I mean, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying about down south for sure. Um, just the, you know, the, I think it's another thing you don't, you don't really realize until you spend some time, you know, the dance and the, the strength of the, the music and the language. Right. Um, yeah, we're, we're in a unique place for that. And it, it's awesome to see those people carrying those, those traditions and, and history on. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was one of the one of the classes uh, that I liked most in in middle school was uh, John Rowan's carving class, and so I'm in there, you know, carving this uh, this piece of, of of alder, and you know, I'm trying to carve through this knot, and I just can't get through it, and I just go over to him, and you know, he just just cleans it out so nicely and so easily with those knives, you know, because you're just you're taking these hacks, man, and these are sharp knives, and I got more than a couple little nicks yeah. in my fingers, but uh, yeah, that's that's fun. You know, at, there, everybody had a little bit of blood on the spoons that they were uh, that they were carving, but uh, you know it's great. It was, yeah, it makes it a, you totally makes you appreciate it a little more. Yeah, when you you put your own blood into it for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you got to yeah. get better. But uh, yeah, his hands were so callous that he could almost stab it and they wouldn't even go through. But uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun for sure. Uh, so I mean, it sounds great uh, and all, but, uh, what are some of the, some of the drawbacks? What are some of the, the obstacles that, uh, that are facing over there? When I, um, substituted that year, uh, that, that I moved back to Kluwak, uh, things had changed a little bit. Uh, what are some of the, uh, what are some of the issues, uh, particularly, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is the drug problems, um, in the community. And that was when, when I was in middle school, we had, a, a an assembly about, uh, not s- sniffing Scotch Guard, and I thought, "Wait, what? Like, what? What? what why are we having this? Like, it, it's a upholstery cleaner or whatever." And like, well, this is this seems ridiculous. But apparently, you know, there was a contingent of, of middle schoolers that were sniffing Scotch Guard to get high. And I thought, "What in the world? What?" Yeah. And it's I, you know that's one of those things where you, you push the limits and you know, hey, I'm cool because I'm doing this. But like, there wasn't like a cool stigma. I was like, "No, that's dumb." Yeah, that's upholstery cleaner. 
Um, but now with the, with the prescription drugs and with, you know, the hard course type stuff, it's, um, it's having a more uh, profound impact on the community. Um, you know, catch can, you know, is, is hurting too, like all rural, all across the United States. Um, what, what impact has, has, has that have had on the, the community as a whole? And, and what do you think we can do about it? Oh man, there's there's a big one. Yeah, <laughs> we we had all the answers to those questions. Yeah, yeah, I I, I sure would like to, to give them out. But, yeah. Uh, no, it's definitely definitely noticeable. Um, like you said, all across the country, I hear, and and definitely it doesn't it doesn't bypass our our small community here. I mean, we have yeah, we have a, a serious substance abuse problem in in this community. I think um, you know what we can do about it is just installing in these kids the uh, at a young age, um, you know, the importance of getting out and, and uh, finding those things that you're passionate about, that you care about, you know, be it, you know, the outdoors and, and connections with nature, um, the arts, anything that, that gets our kids out and, and being active, I'm, I, I think that's huge. Mm-hmm. Um, and and for, for people here, I, I think I think the answer's got to be treatment. You know, we got to get yeah. we got to get people help. We did, I know the mayor has done a great job here in in Kauai cracking down on uh, on uh, you know the opiates and, and heroin coming community. But it's a it's a serious problem, and uh, you know there's there's a lot of a lot of good people around here that that see that and see the you know the, the people walking around like zombies with with, with some serious issues, and it's got to start with getting them some help um because the you know the drugs are drugs are part of the problem but the big problem is is the addiction itself and you gotta you gotta get people in there and and uh get some help in some way yeah um but yeah it's it's definitely definitely above my pay grade solving that one but i yeah you know i do everything i can here trying to get kids active and things they care about get passionate we got a lot of cool projects going here at the school with uh you know get kids outdoors uh looking for DNA samples for wolves. We're doing this whole hairboard thing. We've got kids building a ROV underwater robots, you know, doing all the soldering and electrical work for that. Um, you know, it's, I think it starts with you being passionate and, and uh, setting, a, setting an example of, hey, this is how I live my life. Mm-hmm. You know, what you see and, you know, even with your family members at home, it doesn't have to be that way. Here's, there's a lot of examples of positive adults and yeah. and the way they go about it. So yeah. I think that's all, all you can do sometimes, you know? Yeah. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. That is mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Yeah, that's it. One of the hardest things about it is that if, if you're in an urban setting, a lot of the the things that would be prescribed for treatment would be to go outside and to, you know, connect with nature and be away from stuff, which is exactly what we have outside of our doors. And exactly. So if you're already living in that and then you fall, fall into that stuff, it can be difficult. But I think what you said, you know, giving people the opportunity to live a different story 
and to have something of value in the opportunities mm-hmm. education wise that, Hey, you know what? I'm not going to be the curious teenager or, you know, curious young adult that, that falls into this. I, I have other things that I can do. And, um, you know, it's exactly. Just, yeah. I think it all, you know, it all stems from, you know, boredom and, and, and not getting out there and, and challenging yourself and, and trying new things too. I think, I think that's, you know, that's a huge yeah. part of it. Um, there's, there's so many factors, man, but it's, yeah, I think, uh, I think you're on it. It's, uh, it's finding those things that, that you care about and you're passionate about that you, you would do above hurting yourself, you know, and trying to check out of the world. Yeah. Well, the funny thing you say, uh, that it, people do this out of boredom. It's funny that, you know, you grew up on a, on a houseboat. Yeah, you, there was nothing around, you know, you're, you're out, you're past rural. Um, and say, mm-hmm. I, I didn't like when we grew up, you know, pre internet, whatever, we didn't really know, how to be bored it was like you just that self-sufficiency um what was such a huge right. part of growing up and now you have everything else telling you that you are bored or that nothing's going on uh and it's it's weird it, it totally sound like you know one of those old people all oh, the adults and scolding the young kids for their cell phone use and this and that but it has really uh-huh. alaska used to be way behind everything else but now it's so connected you know like everything is no, I'm, uh, yeah I mean, boredom i think boredom is important you know, you need time to to uh, think about what you want to do and, and uh, have those moments where, you know, you want to uh, find something to do and not be bored, you know. But when, yeah, when you have the technology in your hand, there's, there's really no downtime, you know. And it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. You need you need that time to, you know, grapple with your mind and, and be in your own consciousness. And, um, you know, and, and I think those of us that, that hunt and fish, you know, that's, that's part of it. It's just getting the heck away from people and, and, uh, having some time to, you know, really be in your own head. And, you know, people talk about meditation and, and, uh, you know, just, just having that, that quiet time to be in the woods. And, and it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's very healthy. I think it's very, uh, very good for your mind and, and good for, for your stress. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, I- I chastise myself sometimes on like, this morning I woke up and I was having some coffee and I decided to head out the road and then walk, uh, walk around the trail looking for ptarmigan or grouse. And I thought, man, there was part of me that almost didn't do this. Like part of me was just, Hey, I'm going to sit around, you know, drink some coffee and, and maybe read, which is fine. But you know, maybe I'll go on Netflix and watch meat eater, you know, but, but once I got out on the trail, I thought, man, I can't believe I almost didn't do this. I can't believe that I almost like plugged in, rather than, you know, go walk around. It's just, you know, for an hour and a half, two hours. But it just, it's so accessible and so easy, yet you still have to do it. It's right there, but you still have to, to make a point to do it. I think we kind of get lulled into it doesn't become part of the habit. You know, you like to go, but, you know, a couple of weeks slide away, and all of a sudden it's been two, three, four weeks since you've been outside or just gone for a walk or something like that, and before you know it, it's, you know, well, it's rainy now, and I can't do this. So, uh, making those excuses, especially during winter, man, it's uh, it can be mm-hmm. real cold and real dark. Yeah. But you the, make yourself do it. When the darkness comes in, yeah, the uh, couch potato lifestyle definitely settles in for a lot of people. But yeah. yeah, you gotta gotta still still make that time definitely. And you know, if you're if you're motivated enough and wanting to do it, yeah, you you can find a way. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go back to you were talking about some of the activities that uh, you have for the kids. Uh, talk to me about the the wolf board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a cool project we got going. Uh, this is our our third year uh, working working with uh, ADF and G and Ellen Hannon over in, in Craig School. Cheryl Bobo uh, set up this this program. Uh, the, the wolf the wolf uh, population controversy on the island. I know you you talked. Uh, Definitely about this some on your your podcast yeah. previously. Listened to a couple episodes and <laughs> and uh, yeah, had, had a few people on that had, had some good things to say there. Uh, but it, it's something that's, that's in a lot of the community's mind. It's definitely something in the kids' mind. We have a lot of uh, hunters, trappers uh, here at the school. Um, so basically, what we're doing is we're going out and uh, we got a couple spots where we are setting um, hair boards and basically a uh, you know a foot foot by foot and a half piece of plywood 
uh, with some barbed wire uh, connected to it. And uh, we go out weekly and we bait them with a, a very stinky, uh, pungent wolf lure that uh, the wolves then will, uh, you know, they have a great sense of smell, obviously, and can, can kind of track that down. And they like, they, they like the stinky stuff. You know, they like to get that on them and, and identify other wolves by their smell. And um, so they'll roll on, roll on the boards and what they leave behind is hair, which we then uh, carefully and make sure we're gloved up so we don't get any of our DNA on the sample. We collect that hair, um, send it off to a lab in Montana, actually, and it's a part of a larger, the larger population study that, that's going on um, on the island with fish and game. Um, so it's kind of cool for the kids to do some, some hands-on science of something that, that you know a lot of them are passionate about. And uh, last year we did get two positive wolf IDs, which was pretty cool, and they can even identify the gender of the wolf and uh, went into increasing the, uh, the overall estimate for the population on the island. Um, so it's cool that the kids can see their involvement with science is that directly influencing, you know, something that, that is very real and, and uh, a big issue, you know, people are fired up about. So it's, it's a good way to tie in writing and, and uh, getting kids debating and, and talking about the issue. So. Right. What, uh, what is, are you doing this with uh, middle school kids or is this the high school kids? Uh, middle school, yeah. It's, it's primarily middle school, six, seven, eight. Um, and actually it was pretty cool. Last week, we actually got a Skype with the uh, biologist that does the, the DNA analysis once our samples get, get there. We got to interview her and kids had a lot of really good questions about uh, that side of the job and, and finding out about, you know, how do they, how do they identify the, the sequences of the DNA there to, to tell that each wolf is a wolf and, and, and specifically, you know, that it's this wolf. Uh, it's pretty amazing uh, mm -hmm. what those guys are able to do there. But um, yeah, I'm I'm amazed that the smartness of the wolves. Now, I didn't see a whole lot uh, growing up, and I went on a on a trapping uh, expedition uh, with some of the guys for a, for an article, and just how unbelievably bright they are, and how much time has to go into being able to. So if you're a part of the the fish and game or whoever, and trying to come up with estimates with how thick and wild and rugged the island is and oh i it's it's beyond me i i have i have no idea no estimate in my head about how many wolves are there i i can't even i, I can see both sides like okay that that sounds legit to me and then someone talks to someone else okay that sounds like i'm completely lost when it comes to that um yeah it's crazy but it's that, a good that, time that, to talk with the kids too about you know estimates what does that mean and mm -hmm. you know accuracy and precision and and how uh, how valid is the data? And looking at the map of where the sites are, you know, the, the something we bring up too is the fact that you know all these multiple hairboard sites that they have all across the island are all uh, connected to the road system. There's a large portion of the island that is not, and so right. trying to multiply out that number to to some of those you know wilderness areas with wild areas that it would just be impractical for for anybody to be checking once a week, you know, and rebating. You need you know, you spend millions of dollars and, and, uh, helicopter charters and things like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's definitely important, but it's also good for them to know, you know, Hey, where did these numbers come from? We're actually out there doing it and, and, uh, and, and showing them that we're, we're not quite there to, to get into the, the map, but we've talked about, you know, mark and recapture and, and how, uh, how important it is to identify those individual wolves, but also, also how important it is, you know, it's cool. Some of our wolves have traveled, all across the island, and they were able to tell that uh, within, I think it was like a three-week span, we had wolves going from the, some of the northernmost parts of the island all the way down to Kowak. Um, so they really do travel a mm -hmm. large range of area and are able to move, you know, great distances. And it was cool to see that, you know, some hair hits up from, from the ADF and G study up there, you know, which was the same wolf that came all the way down here to, to right outside of our town. So right. pretty cool. Yeah. But it's, it's a good thing in all of this is it just goes to show how wild Prince of Wales still is and how ridiculous it is at times to apply kind of the down-south logic to it because it's not gridded out. So much of the island you can't access by road. There's a lot of spur roads and there's a lot of old logging roads and this and that, but, I mean, it's so wild. It's, it's still, you know, 
well, it's not untouched because it's been logged so much. But if but if you look at at in compared to some of the areas in California, you go in any direction, you're going to hit a you know major road. Uh, there, it's it's wild. It's it's crazy, um, but nice. Yeah, you know, it's nice I, to live in it, like it's a getting, wild place. It's getting less and less wild. All these Dutch can guys coming over hunting. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just kidding there, Jeff. Um, no, it's, uh, yeah, no, I, I definitely hear you. It's, it's pretty impressive when you look at but all the space, you know, we, I've lived here for, for over 30 years and um, just so many, so many areas still that I have yet to explore, you know, all these bays down south when you get on the other side of the island. Um, you know, we fish commercially for salmon and school going in there and just checking out all the different country and how different the north of the island with the caves and the, the karst you know, topography with all the limestone is from, from down here in the south. And um, it's it's an amazing place. We kind of like to keep it a secret. You know, that's what it makes it unique is uh, the lack of people, too. Right. And, uh, you know, that's one thing I really appreciate. My, I had a, a tough hunting season this year, but one thing I do appreciate about the spot that I go is when I go there, I only see people that I've invited there. And it's, it's really nice to just, you know, have, have a hunt where you're not running into other people on Right. on your, your spot so um it's, it's hard to find it's hard to find those spots now in on prince of wales there are you know there's more and more people out there uh coming onto the island uh mm-hmm. you know you see the see the ferry loading up with with all kinds of kinds of visitors and mm-hmm. um you know but yeah you're, you're right it is still a very a very wild place and i, I think uh i think that's part of what makes it special yeah it's the it's a weird situation for me as a as a writer and columnist. I write about you know fishing and hiking, and hunting. Now, I'm not you know saying that so many people are reading it. They're like, oh man, I read this article by Jeff London. Now I'm going to go to Prince of Wales. But you know, I'm part of that industry <laughs> that's that's encouraging people to go. You know, they read that, and the reason why they read that is because there's something in them that says, I want to do that. You know, this is what's missing. You know, it's it's something that I want to experience. And you look at, you know, the Chamber of Commerce is trying to get more people to come there. And, you know, if you do have visitors, then the, the lodges and the uh, the bed and breakfast and the local people who run businesses, you know, they're dependent upon people coming into town and fishing and hunting and doing all that, which is, you know, promoting more traffic. That's essentially what's going on. And it's a weird, I want to be able to go and fish my part of the Thorn River and not see anybody. But I get that, you know, people need, you know, for the for the local economy, you know, we need tourism. It, we we got to have that. And me writing about the Thorn River, you know, like, oh, if I say Thorn River, oh, maybe maybe it puts the seed in someone's mouth that if the, or the, the seed in their head that, that it's something they want to go out and do. And I'm contributing to uh, getting more people on the river where I want to fish. So it's a weird, weird dynamic. But um, hopefully with some of the roads opening up over here on Revilla. You have a lot more access. So that's the big thing over here. It's a big island, but you just can't get a lot of the spots. Um, but uh-huh. it's, it's 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 beautiful in itself, and I try to get out as much as possible. Um, but you just you know you don't have those spurs, you don't have those logging roads, you don't have uh, as as much to drive, which is which is too bad. But um, yeah, man, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. But still wild. We're still in maybe the goodish goodish old days. I don't see how it's going to be completely uh, ruined, but who knows, man. Yeah, you can't can't stop the progress for sure. And no, I I, I totally get it. It's all about perspective. I mean, we, we go back and forth as, as commercial guys about about the charter industry and then you know, I look at a lot of my, my friends that, that make, make their monies in the summer on guiding for boats and and, and uh you know, uh running lodges, working at lodges. Um there's a lot of a lot of income that pays a lot of people's winter bills here that, that are permanent residents, so I'm uh yeah, I definitely I definitely see it both ways. I mean, you know, it's fun to listen to, uh, you're talking about meat eater that, that guy's got that podcast too. And it's cool to hear about Prince of Wales and hear him talk about, yeah. you know, places that I know. Yeah. But then yeah. again, I'm like, man, shh, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're giving away the spot, you know, it's yeah. just, uh, it's, uh, it's a special place. And, you know, there's a lot of people here that want to, want to protect that and keep it, keep it wild for sure. But it's, uh, yeah, I, I hear you. There's, there's going to be those people that can connect with that and, they they want to get away from the hustle and bustle too. So I'm uh, I'm totally I'm totally aware. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's 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 tough to deprive people of their therapy. You know, that's their two weeks out of the year where they can decompress. You know, and it's good for their souls. And so it's hard to be like, no, this is mine. You can't have it. You know, you made your choice to live in a in a in an urban setting. You got to stay there. Um, 
But yeah. the, the thing that I, I really encourage and I really like it when people, when they do come up, is they get an idea for who lives here and, and what the city is all about. Rather than just come up and consume, consume, consume. You know, the people who come up in the local lodges, you know, talk to the, to, to the fish cutters, you know, talk to the local lodge, uh, lodge owners who own the lodge and live here and, and get a sense for, for what it's like to live here rather than like the purpose of this community is to entertain me. And so I'm up here and just entertain me and provide me with fish and I'm going to go home. Um, I like it when people, you know, taking pictures of, of the totem poles and, and asking, walking around town, just getting a feel for putting money into the, into the economy. And this is a place where people actually live. And I want to know about that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go catch my fish. Or, you know, I'm going to go get my bear. I'm going to go get my deer or do whatever. But the people who are curious about yeah. what the life is like, that's, that's, I, I like those people. I like talking with those people and, and sharing a uh, uh, little bit about what it's like to live here. Uh, yeah, I got a cool story on that. It's kind of a, a positive tourist story here. We got a, I got a couple buddies there that run the, uh, and, and make the drop shot calls. I know uh, yeah, yeah. people know about them. You can find them on Facebook. They're the Cole brothers, uh, Brent and Ryan. Nice. And uh, you are telling me about a story of uh, a couple hundred came up and they got a hold of them. They spent about a week here. You know, they're doing a self-guided hunt on, on the island. Spent a week just, you know, don't, getting after it, you know, trying to listen and talk to everybody and uh, taking any advice they could find. And, uh, you know, didn't see a single buck for a whole week of just searching and searching, uh, hiking and going to musk eggs. And so they got a hold of, hold of those guys and, they set them up with a couple calls and they said, you know, well, here's what you got to do. Go back to a spot where the sign looks good. Spend some time, be patient, you know, and gave them, gave them some tips there. You know, you just uh, go back to where, you know, where you saw some rubs or you saw some sign and, and, uh, just, just put in your time. And, uh, they, they took the advice, went out, blew the, blew that call. And, uh, yeah, I ended up with a nice, Nice big four point buck. So, uh, kind of cool to see, you know, that, that interaction with people that have been around here a long time, know a lot, um, you know, helping people out. Those guys are helping, you know, a creative process of those guys making those calls and uh, doing some really neat things out there at the, the drop shop, you know, the, the drop shot, uh, <laughs> shop there where they make their, their music wood. So pretty, pretty cool to, to see, uh, you know, some, some people that are willing to, to, to talk talk with the locals and help the you know help help that economy of people doing some creative creative projects and put themselves out there a little bit yeah yeah that's good stuff but uh well uh in in, in closing man anything uh, you want to add uh anything uh we didn't cover um what's uh what's the winter looking like for you yeah man i just uh yeah, I'm, a, I'm you know a fan dude i like uh kind of you talk about your living mentally tough and uh and, uh, you're, you know, it's just really cool to see people, you know, kind of like with the, the, the deer call guys there, you know, trying, trying some different things. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, inspirational for people that are out there, you know, trying, trying new stuff, doing the podcast, doing your book thing. Um, I think it's important for, for people to support other people that are taking on creative projects. Um, you know, we talked about some of the issues on the island. Uh, I think I think that's a big part of it is it's supporting other people that are getting after it and, and trying new things and yeah so man I'm I'm excited about the podcast I actually a while back I remember you were in a an all dude book club <laughs> and uh, we actually got a uh, Prince of Wales chapter started here too so nice. pretty cool nice. uh, calling ourselves the Reading Rainbows so <laughs> uh, nice first <laughs> first four months. We we read four books, trying to do a book a month, and just having that uh you know creative discussion and and uh, yeah, it's it's really cool, man, that you're trying some new things, and I hope I hope it keeps going here. Hopefully, you reach the million listeners with this stuff, and yeah, <laughs> always good to talk to you, man. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate all that stuff, and uh, thank you for uh, you know the homeland, you know the, all the stuff that you do. I know it's a Sunday right now, and you're at school setting up a lab for tomorrow, and uh, the amount of time that you put in there, you know, to try to make an impact uh, on those kids, and I'm sure that you do. So, uh, but, uh, thanks again, man, uh, for for uh, spending the time to to chat a little bit, and um, we'll have a have a good week, and 
I'll see you in uh, two weeks when I bring the uh, the old basketball team over there. There we go. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to do another one when we can actually see each other face to face, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, well, have a good one, Jeff, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. I'll, I'll get back to my, my lab here, and yeah, cool. carry on. All right, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Corbin White Miller, the uh, the mad scientist. <laughs>